Hello and welcome to the ISRK podcast. I'm your host, Kumar Vikran. I'm a doctoral candidate at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Hanyang University, Seoul, Korea. ISRK, that is Indian Students and Researchers in Korea, is a voluntary support group that works towards the benefit of the Indian diaspora in Korea. So on today's episode, I have the pleasure to be in conversation with Altinai Kaid Darova. Uh, I, hope, I hope I did not butcher that pronunciation completely. <laughs> so Altinai... Yeah, so Altanai has joined us um, today from Saudi Arabia. She is a PhD candidate at uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST, which is now actually world renowned and doing very well in research and uh, overall education. So Altanai, thank you very much for joining us today and it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's really, really great to be here. Uh, Privyet Kakdela. <laughs> Wow, that's really good. Yeah. Uh, I should teach you some Kazakh as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually, uh, that's the extent of it. So uh, we'll go back to English. Uh, actually, I'm very much fascinated with Russian, and uh, one, some of my favorite authors are also uh, Russians, like Dostoevsky, Mikhail Bulgakov. So, uh, Russian culture always fascinated me for some reason. So that's why I just picked up a little bit of Russian. And also, uh, lots of um, Koryo Saram people. Do you know about them? Korean? Uh, Koryo Saram. So, actually, many Koreans uh -huh. moved to Russia before. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. So later during uh, World War, so they were actually shifted to the Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. So, mm -hmm. so lots of those Koreans now actually move back to Korea and also uh, several, of, several of these Central Asian countries have scholarships for those students, for ethnic Korean students to come to Korea and study. So at Hanyang University, we have uh, lots of like Kazakh students and Central Asian students. So through them, I actually came to know about uh, Kazakh culture and Central Asian culture a lot. So yeah, <laughs> so that's a bit of background. <laughs> nice. Yes, uh, we have a lot of Koreans. I in fact, I have a few friends, Korean friends in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. One oh. of them right now in uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's working. Oh, yeah. We ah, started okay. to get in the UK and then uh, mm -hmm. she's in Korea. All right. So um, to begin the conversation, uh, so your uh, ed higher education journey began when you went to Singapore, I suppose, like for that uh, prep course at NTU, Nanyang Technological University. So I wanted to know like uh, how your experience was, and I can also relate to it because I uh, have been to Singapore and um, other places, but more importantly, I wanted to know like how does it feel like to expand our horizons and come into contact with a new culture and um, a higher education environment? Well, that's a great start. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you a little brief history how I ended yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, it started in the high school, obviously, as for any other person. Mm -hmm. And I was very passionate about mathematics and mm. I was studying it very hard yes. but at the same time i was very interested in languages and mm. then learning english and history and by the end of the high school i was like okay <laughs> mm. i really like this. i'm not sure what to do yeah so uh, i got accepted um to the best university in kazakhstan for mm -hmm. humanitarian studies for international relationship uh, course Oh. And um, yes, <laughs> at that time it was considered the most demanding, the most prestigious uh, uh, oh, I see. field mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan. So I was like, okay, let's go there. But after around half a year, I came to a realization that it's not really something that I want to devote for years. I think mm. this kind of school could be developed as you go, um, mm -hmm. using a different kind of resources. There is internet and then... Uh, you just need to communicate more and uh, write essays as much as you oh, want. Right. But yeah. if you want to do four years dedication for bachelor, it's better to go technical to learn hard skills, soft skills, and to really have some um, solid knowledge in in science. Uh -huh. So um, I applied to a government scholarship. It's called Bolashak okay. in Kazakhstan. Uh -huh. And it's really... Um, uh, amazing scholarship that um, gives opportunity to students to study mm. 
hello altenai yeah i think there's yes. a uh, oh yeah so there was a bit of lag so can you just uh, uh, go back to your uh, i think there's some oh yeah yeah now you're back <laughs> Might be mine. Um, it's Wi Fi. Okay, now it looks okay, I think. Yeah. Ah, you're okay, back. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did we stop? Where did uh, we stop? Oh, yeah. So you were talking about that international relations course, and then you were saying that it was not something that you were that interested in pursuing. So you were, it, yeah. Yes. And uh, so I applied to. Um, international scholarship in Kazakhstan. It's a government okay. scholarship. Mm -hmm. They actually allow, give opportunity to students like me to mm. study abroad, mm -hmm. um, to choose any university basically. Um, mm. So I looked what are the most demanding professions in 2010 in Kazakhstan, and it was telecommunications. Ah, I see. <laughs> and I thought, okay, where are the telecommunications? Uh, um, you can study it uh, mm -hmm. in a high level. So I'd look, okay, let's go high and let's go Singapore. Mm. And I just picked Singapore. <laughs> non, non, yeah, non Singa young. Singapore is very advanced. So yeah, makes very sense. Advanced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Nanyang Technological University. Mm -hmm. Actually at that time they were ranked 70 in the world. Right now they're like mm. 10. Yeah, top yeah, 10. yeah. They are generally and, in top 10 or top 15 all the time. So. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Now they are very tall. Mm. And uh, so I got accepted and I went to Singapore. So Singapore, it was of course the first and the um, experience, first impression of the uh, foreign country. It's yeah. uh, like a, not only dream come true, but it's like being in a different, totally different um, uh, atmosphere. So mm. you may relate to me. So you can straight away the first thing that hits you is the skyscrapers it's a modern city <laughs> also the um, greenery like uh, everywhere there is plants so yeah <laughs> yeah the unique part is it is a mm. it's not a skyscraper it's like in new york but it's also super green it's tropical country mm -hmm. and um cosmopolitan country so it was like a city that came from the future back to us and you're right, just right. like in the future <laughs> i understand and, your feeling <laughs> yes of course yeah uh, and then, of course, there was the studies. We studied mm. mathematics, physics, and English um, with 12 Kazakhs from Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And we were um, eager to learn. And, <laughs> and I, I found that it was really unique experience because not only you have a really high standard of education there, um, you also socialize. You also yeah, yeah. have a cultural experience. Um, there are so different many nationalities, Chinese, Indians. Mm -hmm. Asians and uh, um, Western people, so it was really mixed, multicultural, amazing environment to mm -hmm. to be to start the career, academic career. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I came to a realization that um, um, it's only it's not only only about studies. It's mm. uh, also about having connections, having right, uh, right, right, around the world, and uh, having connections like this, even if virtual. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, right. and, um, <laughs> yeah, actually, so one year. okay, uh, uh, go ahead, you go ahead first. Ah, it's okay. So we just started one year, it's mm -hmm. a level. Uh, so after Kazakhstan, um, because in Kazakhstan we have 11 years of education, yeah. we have to have mm -hmm. levels, yeah. Mm, so we had it in Singapore. Yeah, so many universities actually uh, ask these students to have at least like 12 years of a high school uh, school education before. So, uh, yeah, so I understand that. And also you touched upon a very important point, actually. It's not only academics and science or mathematics. After all, we are humans first and then academics later. So <laughs> we, socialization <laughs> and building a human connection is very important. Yeah, I understand mm -hmm. that. So later from Singapore, you moved to Liverpool uh, for your undergrad studies. So I, I, I think Liverpool is much more multicultural than mm -hmm. uh, Singapore or other Asian countries. So how was your experience like? And uh, I wanted to know, like for international students, like going to a new setting and such uh, multicultural area. And so how does that experience feel like? And what has your experience been like? Okay, just um, let me rewind a little bit. Mm -hmm, so okay. in Singapore, at the end of the Singapore, um, we had to pass entrance exam uh, mm. to get to Nanyang University, but okay. none of us passed. And <laughs> it was, 
Okay. It was over, you know. Ah. Um, mm. I never failed any exams in my life, and this was. Oh, the I understand. Yeah. The heartbreak, and then, oh. and I got accepted in a good universities like Toronto, Birmingham, Cardiff, mm -hmm. and Liverpool. Mm -hmm. But taking into account my experience that I had in Singapore, I thought, okay, maybe I should be more realistic and take it slowly in a um, uh, not so high university. Maybe uh, it will be best for me. This is because um, the government scholarship, it's really uh, very strict. You have to be uh, high. You have to, you have, your scores have to be high. Okay. And if you are not performing well, they not only you have to pay everything back, but mm -hmm. they take you half. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, so there are conditions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, was, I thought, let's be in a comfortable environment and just uh, study hard in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never regretted the choice. Liverpool was an amazing place for mm -hmm. students, multicultural, as you say. Mm -hmm. It's actually the perfect uh, little town for student life. I, mm -hmm. It's much uh, smaller than Manchester and or London. London. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's it's really comfortable to be in to study. Environment is great. Multicultural in my university, in my department, electrical department, mm -hmm. most Asians, uh, especially after second year, we had uh, yeah, two hundred or two hundred something people from China came, mm. and I just blended. <laughs> <laughs> um, and few girls, maybe seven, eight girls, and uh, uh, but in other departments, yes, we had. Mm, many other nationalities as well um yes the first year was very i think the it's hard to adapt for the first year mm -hmm. because you really don't know what to expect there and uh, you just come and hope for the best <laughs> yes <laughs> all you do is uh, study hard and you really don't know how the exams will go yeah, was yeah. The yeah. because there everything depends on your final exam mm. so you can study hard the whole semester but if you didn't do well in the exam it's uh sure, yeah well, <laughs> so you really start the hut till the end of semester <laughs> actually every day i was in the library oh wow. had good study friends study um whom i communicate and um, they explained to me i explained to them it's really it was really helpful and how, how are the professors there professors mm -hmm. in liverpool so how was your experience with the professors <laughs> the professors were really good in teaching mm -hmm. <laughs> most of them and i was lucky that most of them had a good english <laughs> because <laughs> it was the first year yeah, and yeah, yeah. Some of the people could have a scouse accent which is mm. really understandable yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, our department all of them had a really great english yeah. most of them are foreigners actually mm -hmm. from um, pakistan iran we had mm -hmm. and some uh, english people mm. um, um Yes, and they were uh, the, they were doing their research. Yeah. At that time, I had no idea what it means. I understand that, right? <laughs> something they are doing something great. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, mm. But I can enjoy the courses. Yeah. By by any chance, are you a, a football fan, or do you watch football or soccer, or what? What sport uh, is played in Kazakh Kazakhstan? Not cricket. Not cricket for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, so mostly guys, I think they play football mm -hmm. uh, because in, it's really easy. You just need a ball and just imaginary right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, in every uh, and then yeah, you don't need much equipment for that. So. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah. For, for guys, for mm -hmm. girls, I don't know. We just play easy. <laughs> oh, okay. As long as mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. uh, boxing in um in um, how they call it mm. wrestling. Mm. Wrestling and oh, fighting yeah. is popular in Kazakhstan. Our <laughs> men are really good at this. Do you know DGG? Uh, not really. Uh, Gennady Golovkin, he is the world champion. Oh, okay. Mm, never yeah, beaten I... once. Only beaten oh. once recently, but it was in his career, never beaten. <laughs> That's fine. Mm -hmm. I, I, actually, I, I'm not a sports fan. It was just a random question. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. So moving ahead, like I'm very curious, like how many languages do you speak? Oh, that's a great question. As I said, I was very interested in languages, but mm. I only know three uh, fluently. So mm. it's uh, so Russian, Russian, English, and Kazakh. Exactly. But I try to learn Turkish. Wow. I'm learning Chinese 
but it's it's very at the beginning <laughs> because yeah. my husband is Chinese, so oh, okay. I really need to know yeah. something. <laughs> Um, but uh, unfortunately yeah, I, in chinese uh, so mandarin right so ah uh, yes mandarin um, i just know like uh, small phrases like nihoma and same <laughs> and i know hand is called no no mm, i forgot i just know like <laughs> xie xie and uh, boka xie and some some mm. of the words yeah because there are many chinese in my department as well in my lab as well so uh, we so i just pick up some words but nothing more than that so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the thing yeah because here they encourage us to speak english even yeah, though yeah. here is, mm -hmm. yeah we cannot speak other language i mean we can but it, it, it's course, not yeah. Yeah. yeah because the curriculum is international and everything is international so when it comes to the global setting we have to have a good command of english so mm. Mm. Yeah, so moving ahead, like, uh, let's talk about your research work. Uh, you I want just, to say something? Yeah. Let me just a few points. Like in Singapore, there was an accent, it's English. That was really hard. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was really there's, hard a, there's a different uh, accent. Like, so initially, I was also like, when I get into a cab in Singapore, like, sometimes I was having difficulty understanding what the, uh, what they're saying. But after a while, you get used to it. it it's just the accent mm -hmm. thing. Yeah yes and then I, I said okay now i go uk everything will be great but then there was this class accent <laughs> it's, it's, also it's, they, they add la la at yeah. the end of sentence in singapore yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was and um i forgot to mention that in um it was completely different environment in uk in terms of uh, uh, environment okay. very conservative there is no skyscrapers whatsoever but oh, it's okay. just uh -huh. Historical buildings everywhere. <laughs> well, they're beautiful, mm -hmm. but the weather is. I I hear the weather is not that shiny in England. Oh yes, that is another point for adaptation. Um, the first year oh. is hard to not to have the sun, especially after Singapore. Mm. Uh, Singapore oh yeah, oh, yeah. Every day sun. You go there. Also you know, very warm, but in I suppose in England you have to like face the winter. Oh, that's nothing for a Kazakh person. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. <laughs> yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, let's move in and talk about your research work. And mm -hmm. so you have been uh, working on variable sensors and advanced materials, and uh, your research is very much applied. Like uh, you have a mm -hmm. range of spectra. Like that's what fascinated me at first. Like you were also doing uh, wildlife conservation, and also you have like mot motor sports on one end, wildlife wildlife conservation on the other, and a host of things in the middle, like healthcare and others. So how did that happen? And uh, what is uh, like can you talk about your research work and how does it impact the society at large thank you so much that's mm -hmm. a great question so let's start from sensor technologies mm -hmm. so um fundamental building blocks for advanced multitude of advanced applications mm -hmm. i think you're well aware of internet of things mm -hmm. and um, force technological revolution and they form a basic block that collect the data which is very important for us Mm -hmm. analyze the environment, analyze the healthcare, different kind of information. So as an engineer, we are interested to develop sensors that are more resilient, high performance, um, fabricated using sustainable means, uh, um, more flexible, compliant and so on. And, and I use a graphene. Um, I exploit graphene to fabricate such sensors. So um, mainly I am interested in physical sensors made of graphene. Such, so we fabricate magnetic sensors, flow sensors, strain, um, conductivity, temperature, pressure, and salinity, so on. And uh, uh, um, the unique part of my research, I think, is to uh, obtaining graphene in a one step using one step fabrication process. Mm. It's called laser graphene. Mm. Uh, so this allows us to form and pattern graphene in a solid state mm -hmm. and on a flexible substrate like a, just a plastic so you can really scrap your own design customizable design on a flexible substrate of graphene but it's a porous graphene mm. and, uh, and can uh, apply it for different applications since it's a uh, lightweight flexible uh, customizable for different shapes and sizes and so on um, so, as you said, yes, we used it in the wearable devices, for example, 
uh, whenever the person walks or um, do exercises for joint bending applications, heartbeat, uh, plant the pressure, pressure of the feet. Uh, also, to show it that it can cope with the harsh environment, we used it in the marine applications in a Red Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so we not only measure the pressure of the sea down two, two kilometers down in the sea, mm -hmm. we also measure salinity, flow of the water and the water, mm -hmm. and um, uh, just show that it can survive in a harsh environment like this. Because right. mm -hmm. I don't know if you don't know, the Red Sea is the warmest and the most most of this one of the most saline uh, seas in the world. Oh, so lots of minerals, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we measured the speed of the dolphins and so on. <laughs> and also, we used it as a tactile sensor in robotics um, for magnetic sensor. And we used it for speed measurements of drones. So mm. there are a lot of different exciting applications. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I had opportunity to apply them even to a Formula One car. Which oh, yeah, is a yeah. McLaren. McLaren. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was so the scope is really broad. Mm -hmm. uh, the matter is uh, in sensing. The same sensing principles apply to different kind of applications and customized, of course. Um, yeah, um, the oh, I in, think the uh -huh. the interesting part is is that graphene is is really hard to obtain, right? It's a, this is because it's very expensive and it involves very multi-step processes. Uh, that are highly intensive in energy. So it's really, we cannot obtain graphene in a high volume. In my research, we do it quickly, easily, low cost and uh, straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. okay. yes. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Like, what do you think uh, where the graphene is going? Because many, mm -hmm. graphene is like a wondrous material. Like you said, mm -hmm. it has various applications like used in adsorbents, catalysts, sensors, mm -hmm. etc. So where do you think this technology is going and uh, what are the current drawbacks that are making it like not available in the bulk, like as you said, like a bulk commodity? Uh, one thing that comes to my mind is like you said, a large scale production. And mm -hmm. uh, the other is like, uh, most times we have to like adapt it, like make it functionalized or as a composite or in other uh, shapes and forms for practical applications. So what do you think where the research is going and uh, what needs to happen to make graphene uh, like this big thing in the market okay so as you said yes graphene is a wonder material and mm -hmm. uh, it made a lot of hype <laughs> yeah right, that's right that's right yeah when it came out uh, in 2000 it was in 2010 there was a Nobel yeah about Prize. that time yeah yeah yes and since then people have been trying to really uh, live up to this hype and really try to do something uh, okay. to really have this. So they believed, okay, we, in the past, we live in the stone age yeah. because the era is uh, described usually by the materials that we yeah. use. So we use mm -hmm. the stone age and the iron age. Now we live in a silicon age and oil, but future they believed is will be graphene. Mm -hmm. Graphene age is diamond age. So um, the because it has such an outstanding uh, properties so you i think you may know like it, it's a, yeah it's thousand times thinner than a paper mm -hmm. uh four times uh, stronger than diamond it's um uh, more conductive than the copper so it's amazing so in using these characteristics we can make for example the phone that doesn't crack we can do the car that um, charge very quickly within seconds uh, we can do uh, desalination easily, yeah, yeah. and most importantly, by compatible wearable sensors. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, e e there are two ways. There are mainly two ways to obtain graphene, which is top down mm -hmm. and down to top. Both of them is really hard uh, to do in terms of um, complexity application mm -hmm. in upscale. And uh, it's really expensive. Now, yeah, yeah. At the moment, what the, you have maybe you see in the market is a compound um, uh, that is mix of graphene or uh, a 3D graphene, uh, which is mm -hmm. like a powder. Mm -hmm. But there is sometimes, no really uh, sometimes aerogels and stuff like that as well. Yeah, aerogels exactly. So there is no really. Only, I think, in China, I've seen they are really fabricating 2D in a mm. uh, more or less wafer scale. Okay. 
It's nothing what we have predicted in the 2010. We can do the elevator to the space using graphene. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think that's the point of research as well. Like we move step by step and find new solutions to tackle the problem. Exactly. Move step by step. And there was a lot of progress, of course, using graphene. There were, yeah, there yeah. were a multitude of amazing applications in different fields chemistry in almost and, all fields uh, graphene you can find applications in almost all fields exactly all fields yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as an engineer i was more interested in yes in obtaining graphene in a more straightforward easy uh sure, yeah manner and uh, just apply them and see how it, they operate and we found that our graphene that we get is actually stable up to 400 celsius degrees wow. which is um, very high temperature mm -hmm. and they still um we're in, able uh, to in nitrogen atmosphere or in air in air <laughs> mm, that's that's pretty good yeah yes mm. um uh, yes and then uh, they could um they would stand many bending uh mm. cycles as well as uh the two megapascal of pressure which is mm. as i said two, around two kilometers down in the sea so there are a lot of different um amazing features also it's antioxidant or has antimicrobial actions mm -hmm. yeah, that was described by another group and but it's biocompatible so it's and corrosion resistant yeah so it's really interesting uh, mm -hmm. feature that we can utilize yeah but for for it to be completely biocompatible i think it's the particle size must also be playing a big role right because mm -hmm. nowadays there is a new research shows that if the particle size is too small then it may get like stuck in the inside the cell or things like mm -hmm. that. So I think that's also one of the consideration that's going into the modern research. Yeah. But in no, general, it's not toxic, so that's good. <laughs> yes, we have done cytotoxicity tests and it showed that it's not toxic, but yeah. no one really ha can define what is really by a competitive. Yeah, right, right, right. It's really like uh, everyone, every researcher says a bit different thing, <laughs> yes. but um, so far it, it was not recognized it's, as a it's doing not... pretty good as compared to some other alternatives so anyway mm -hmm. yeah ah, i learned that you do some air pollution uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, research and actually this in use was commercialized there is a real product out there right now uh, for air mm -hmm. cleaning mm -hmm. so they use it with a filter and coat it with laser in use yeah to fill the air <laughs> yes, yes. So it's, it's finding applications almost everywhere and Particularly in sensors, graphene is is very good because, uh, like like you said, it because generally it's a, the conductivity property is generally exploited in case of sensors. And, mm -hmm. you yeah. Know, so. and yeah, so they are, give a little bit of current to, for mm -hmm. this. Yeah, yeah. In the uh, yeah for <laughs> yeah for example, in case of like gas sensing, so we just so mm -hmm. we put the graphene. So when the uh, gas molecule like adsorbs on it, the conductivity changes because of mm -hmm. electron redox properties basically and then you can just measure the signal calibrate it and there you have it a good sensor <laughs> so yes, this, our application is, is uh, immense we have mm. yes there are researchers who is doing the gas sensor and then biosensors mm -hmm. for glucose uh, sensing and right, right. All functionalization on top on top of the surface um in my research i'm more interested in physical sensors ah, okay than, like uh, pressure driven right pressure driven mechanical sensors basically mm -hmm. so, but there are a lot of right now uh, interesting applications in different fields right so Altinai, um so you worked on like like i said on one end of the spectrum you were like applying the sensors in wildlife conservation and on the other end you have like motor sports so how did that come <laughs> came to happen like uh, it's a i think it it must be the magic of your university right like cows uh mm -hmm. cows programs bringing everything together so i want to hear more about that so yeah yes i was absolutely privileged to mm -hmm. be involved in these uh amazing projects mm -hmm. yes i was working with dolphins and turtles as well as uh, mm. McLaren. Yeah. <laughs> <And> I would, <laughs> yes. yeah i've never imagined that in my life but it is right. as you said um uh, all the credits goes to cows to, mm -hmm. to the to their projects their collaborations mm -hmm. through their collaborations that they establish we can um, offer our ideas mm -hmm. our solutions and so on and um, so cows in, in general is a unique place 
It's a if it's a mono city, it's in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, the, next to the Red Sea. Just in front of me, there is a Red Sea right now. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, a privilege. Yeah. It's a real priv privilege. Uh, there are around 7,000 people here, mm -hmm. uh, 1,200 students. 80% of the students are PhD students. Wow. Uh, oh, that's exactly, wow. Yes. And we don't have bachelor, it's just a master in the ah, So it's like a grad school completely. Mm -hmm. The amount of students, as you can see, is very small, 1,200, but uh, they pay the gift to a full development to each person. I would say mm -hmm. they give they pay attention um, to each of the students to for mm -hmm. them to strive mm -hmm. to reach their full potential. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, yes, um, the, I was lucky with my advisor, Professor Jurgen Kosal, and other professors who really uh, give me opportunities to uh, show uh, what I can do in different uh, fields. Yeah. And when there was this collaboration with McLaren, um, my professor said, okay, we, we can <laughs> offer something to them. And we offered, they liked it, and uh, we uh, applied to their car park, our sensors. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just a small uh, project with them. Uh, McLaren is also interested in air dynamics and then combustion, which is also cost offering them different solutions. Yes, there is a like a five. It was a five-year contract with a, with them, and then uh, yeah. it has been quite fruitful for both sides. <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to go to the pit lane of McLaren, so I was there with a, a motorsport giants in their garage. Uh, so all the so how I was that just, experience like? Uh, oh, yeah. uh, at that time, to be honest, I was not a big fan. I ah, didn't yeah. know much about the uh, Formula One. Mm -hmm. And then um, I started watching a lot of things. Have you watched on Netflix, uh, Drive to Survive? Mm, I haven't, no. <laughs> there is a very nice series about Formula One. So after this experience, I became a huge fan. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot yeah. of things about them. Wow. Um, yes. And after that, I met one more time all the giants, all the motorsport giants, all the celebrities. So it, it's extraordinary, unique experience that yeah. I will... That influenced me a lot, actually. Uh -huh. It showed me a different perspective. Um, that there is actually, we can really do something as a researcher. Not only... That's right, yeah. Not not only publish papers, but really uh -huh. apply to and be useful um, to society. Yeah, for researchers, that's one of the best experiences to see your stuff going into the real world. So, yeah, actually, yeah, in one of the previous episodes, I was talking with uh, Dr. Victoria. She's from Ireland. And uh, mm. she, she was actually involved in oncology research, that's cancer research. And mm -hmm. uh, she was even a principal investigator. But then she transitioned her career to go into uh, Novartis. It's a big pharmaceutical company. So she shifted gears from academia to go into the industrial setting. And what she mm -hmm. said that many people are pursuing that pathway because they do not see in the academic setting their research transitioning into the real world so that you touched upon like seeing your work actually working in the real world so that's the i think the exceptional feeling for a researcher it's exceptional of course it's not mass the sensors are not mass marketed we just customize sure, yeah. the mm -hmm. lab environment to them mm -hmm. but uh, yeah i absolutely agree uh, it, it it gives you a sense of um, accomplishment yeah accomplishment that <laughs> this is really useful for someone of something sure. anything <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. yes and uh, yes many students are at the end of PhD then think to go industry because they really right, want to be right. um, useful to society I would say have an impact to the sure to the yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah nowadays also I'm like um, I'm very much intrigued by cows and mm -hmm. uh, because I see uh, lots of like top scientists working at KAUST and uh, I, I read that the, uh, the KAUST was ranked number one in the QS, like number of citations per faculty. I, I think I saw, yeah, okay. So, so that's quite fascinating and uh, it must be a great privilege to be uh, working there and uh, I hope it, it does well, yeah. Yeah, I was really lucky to mm -hmm. find about KAUST. Uh, KAUST is actually 2000 was open in 2000. It's uh, relatively new, yeah. As compared to other it was, universities, it's very new, but it's doing very well. So It's 12 years old only. And uh, yes, they reached um, mm. number one citation per faculty. 
and um, we have top scientists, as you say, top faculty, yeah, yeah. multidisciplinary research, and deep tech uh, entrepreneurship uh, here. Uh, so that was my like main three points why I chose us. Mm -hmm. They offered an amazing. Yeah, that's interest. what I wanted to ask you as well. Like the, your reasons uh, coming to Kaus. So yeah. Yes, they were for multidisciplinary research. Amazing faculty uh, from top uh, professors oh, of the yeah, world. Yeah. And, and also, if you, you have a chance to do startups or entrepreneurship, there is a whole uh, different area, the half of the cost dedicated ah. to it. So, uh, and they offer amazing facilities, right, um, right. starting with the collabs and uh, uh, from, like uh, anything to do, everything provided for your research. Mm -hmm. Also, the living conditions. Uh, is amazing here. Not oh only yeah, I I actually visited Kaust's webpage and saw their scholarship <laughs> is very generous. I was like, <laughs> wow, like <laughs> master students uh, they get two thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars per year mm. for PG thirty thousand dollars per year. Uh, nice. And we also provide the um, medical insurance and they can go home. They provide m uh, money to go home, depending where you live, depends on the distance but it's very generous. So basically we have everything here to focus yeah, on research. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we are not, uh, our attention is not uh, deviated, uh, pivoted <laughs> towards pay paying bills because we don't pay any bills <laughs> um, or uh, reaching the, your place, uh, like the campus, the, yep. my office is just like five minutes away of walking. And so it's a, I would say uh, they created an uh, extraordinary environment to do research for people like us. And right. of course, it's a mono city, as you said, it's a campus, and mm -hmm. we have opportunity to travel all around the world because Saudi Arabia is just in the middle of uh, Eurasia. I mean, in mm -hmm. Asia, it's here. Yeah, it's in a Europe. sweet spot. Like, er everything <laughs> is like not too far away, except a few places, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have a lot of uh, Indian uh, people here, and oh. maybe you have a lot of friends, a lot of uh, um, colleagues that uh, from India. Also, um, Saudi Arabia is a very unique place, isn't it? Like, um, yes. you have like snowy mountains, uh, beaches, as well as uh, like you have everything. Like, uh, but many times, like Saudi Arabia does not get a good press because of maybe political reasons or other reasons, but. In general, I think it's a very fast, you also have a desert. So you have almost mm -hmm. all kinds of geographical regions. Yeah. Actually, when I came right here in 2016 mm -hmm. uh, for masters, um, it was more strict. Um, you mm -hmm. have to wear a tire, like a full uh, in, in public? Yes, in public. I mean, outside, not here. Not, in Kaos, uh, you can wear normal okay, clothes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and then women couldn't drive and so on. Now mm -hmm. I could see the whole development. Not They opened up tourism. There is e-visa. You don't need to wear full coverage of bio. Mm -hmm. uh, you can drive. Uh, tourism is going very well. Mm, nowadays, uh, it's, uh, they are like pushing tourism a lot. And I'm seeing the development, yeah. They have created Neom. It's mm -hmm. a, a city of the future. All mm. the advanced technologies are applied there. Yeah. Like the packages, everything comes with a drone. We also have here at Calstash things, but there mm. they are putting renewable energy. Everything is smart city, basically. Uh, they also have Red Sea research uh, developments. Mm. So a lot of uh, budget is invested in there. So they are developing very um, in a high pace, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, and yes, as you said, this year we I experienced for the first time in Saudi Arabia the, mm -hmm. the snow. <laughs> there is no snow. Usually it's almost 45 degrees in summer. And how can you ever have a snow? But th this time we will like to experience it in the mm -hmm. north of the mm. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks and for sharing your experience. Yeah. Sounds fun. Mm -hmm. And also good to know about Saudi Arabia and Kaust. And thanks for sharing your experience. Oh, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of things to talk about us. It's, uh, it's just incredible. It's a life changer, game changer, please. <laughs> yes. And uh, so talking about your research work, um, I, as like I'm in, like you said, like I'm involved in air pollution research, more on the remediation aspect of it, not the um, specific environmental pollution aspect of it, but I'm interested in that, obviously. So you have mm -hmm. like 
in field experience working with uh, wildlife and you applied your sensors on dolphins tortoise etc so how does the anthropogenic pollution created by human or like uh, untreated waste generated by various industries impact the wildlife on the ground because uh, in in my um group or in my um how do you say connections i have very few people like i think you are the first one who actually has on the field experience of seeing mm. the devastation that the industry uh causes on on the wildlife so i want to know about that aspect like what have you seen and what has your experience been like regarding that so in all the experiences with the life, wildlife, um, we're under the supervision of marine scientists. We, we mainly work with marine life and we have a very big professor here, a um, renowned professor. His name is Carlos Duarte uh -huh. and he is the head of the, uh, it's called KISS, Coupled Animal Art Artificial Sensing Project, where we apply the latest uh, novel technologies to study the behavior, the location, the movement of the animals as they swim through the environment mm. and the environment as well. Right. So from the research, what they told us that there are a lot of pollutants that is going on in a marine environment and it's well known for everyone and it's, it has a huge impact. For the last, I think in the last 40 years, we mm -hmm. lost more than um, 60 or 70 percent of wildlife in marine life so it's a there are huge numbers there and um, the main pollution is starting from the marine noise there mm -hmm. is a lot of noise that comes from people <laughs> that really affects to them uh, pollution from plastic and so on um sewage and all kind of garbage um oil drillings um all kind of um pesticides and then uh, um, fishing net mm -hmm. incidents and fishing oh yes the nets and the chemical uh, pollutions mm -hmm. so everything is affecting to their population unfortunately and they are um yes um but the red sea is the least affected but there is oh, okay. a bleach going on this is due to the climate change bleach mm -hmm. means uh, uh, they're basically dying they become white and uh, they die because the, of the, you're talking about the coral reefs right coral reefs mm -hmm. exactly uh, but as a I'm not a marine scientist, so I really, uh, uh, it's not my field of expertise, I would say, but we just know what's, what they tell us. And right. when we work with dolphins and turtles, mm -hmm. uh, we're not allowed to touch them. We just bring oh. our mm. and there are specially trained uh, people um, who actually work with them. We just give yeah. our stuff and they <laughs> apply to things. Um, yes, everything related to wildlife, we have to have uh, someone uh capable of uh working those who them. have undergone the training the requisite training to handle the marine life and, yeah. exactly exactly uh, and there are a lot of things to take into consideration when working with wildlife yeah mm -hmm. also i wanted to know like yeah you designed the sensors for uh, these marine animals right so uh what consideration goes into that like you said like um the Red Sea has lots of minerals in it and all that. And also it must be comfortable for the animal, I reckon, right? Okay. So, so the, yeah. Yes. The main concern is to make less intrusive, mm. more comfortable, so that uh, it's where they don't feel what they're wearing. So mm. it doesn't affect their normal behavior. Yeah. Uh, if something bulky on you, you, you don't act normally, right? If you if you, you have a, something heavy <laughs> on you, you, you would not act uh as you would do in normal life so that's right. what we try to do we try uh very flexible mm -hmm. uh stretchable we try to do um uh, very thin uh soft sensors. materials uh, sorry uh like uh use a soft substrate to exactly soft substrates and uh with magnetic sensor we or super uh tiny ones that mm. have a low weight well, it depends on the weight of the animal. If it's a seal, for example, it's okay if it's a bit heavy, a bit more, uh, less flexible, but it's if a small fish, it's really hard to apply anything on it. So we- And they all, we, uh, their uh, skin, their, is it skin? Uh, animal skin, right? So it must be very slippery as well, right? For marine life, so. Yes, <laughs> it's yeah. very slippery and there are a lot of different ways that we try to come up with to attach the sensors. Mm. Um, I, 
the main part uh, is the hardest part is uh, uh, battery, the battery in the oh, yeah. communication, communication tank. Sensors we can do very right now. It's very, mm -hmm. uh, we could say it's advanced level because it's it can be really stretchable and flexible, mm -hmm. but then batteries are very heavy. So it, mm -hmm. it's hard to get a small, a small fish uh, in the communication tank, mm -hmm. especially if it's in the Red Sea or somewhere. Um, where it should uh, communicate with satellite to get the data. Right. Uh, it's it is not easy. So how but long does a battery last usually? Oh, it depends on the whole uh, set, settings of the mm. tag, how many parameters it uh, measures. Mm. Uh, at the moment, the, it's possible to. So it only records on the certain period, not all the time continuously. A uh, few months, few months oh. around. Okay. It depends. Yeah. It depends. It depends. It depends. But it's, yeah. it's possible um, with the satellite. But mm -hmm. there is another way you can come out. So it's attached to the fish, and mm -hmm. after predetermined time, it flows to the surface, oh. and then you can go and collect it. Oh, so it floats <laughs> on the surface. Wow. <laughs> it, it it flows to the surface and um, sends uh, data to receiver, mm -hmm. and from receiver maybe you can also. From receiving, you know where is its location. Uh, but the science is so fascinating. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really amazed by science in all aspects. <laughs> yeah. So. So yes, it, it's called uh, Internet of Marine Life. So yeah, uh, engineers here we try to come up with different kind of devices, communication settings, in uh, all the whole how to say technological package mm -hmm. to be able to monitor the sea environment and the animal's behavior. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm curious to know, like when you, uh, these sensors go into the wildlife, so biofilm must also be developing on them. So does that affect the sensor response or? Oh, that is actually one of my um, mm -hmm. main studies and discoveries uh, for laser juice graphene. Mm -hmm. uh, Biofarming did not affect to the uh, measurements of salinity. Um, Biofouling only accumulates maybe on a, sometimes mm. on a plastic itself, but on graphene, wow. nothing is accumulated. So that was really interesting to discover. Um, and it's a very big problem nowadays. Uh, right. Concerning uh, sea uh, uh, devices in the sea. Right. Um, like, for example, all the ships, they need some kind of coatings. They actually use graphene coatings to... Oh, right now, really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, to... Not to accumulate this biofouling, mm -hmm. which is a different kind of bio bioorganisms that attach them. Right, like small them. organisms like mollusks and others. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and they try different coatings nowadays. Graphene is one of them mm -hmm. in the bottom of the ship. Yes. All right. So we talked a lot about uh, research work and other stuff. And um, so I wanted to know, like, how about communicating science? For example, uh, like right now we are doing research and all this, but generally uh, many times we communicate with high school children and maybe people from non-specialized disciplines who might not know what graphene is, sensor technology and stuff like that. So how do we com communicate our knowledge or the scientific knowledge to them so that it develops a curiosity in them so that later on they can pursue science or advance it? So what is your take on that? Exactly. So this is very important, I think, mm -hmm. for no, it's us, very important, the yeah. elder generation, to pass on our passion, our excitement to them, <laughs> because most of the time science is associated with something strict, something um, also very strict. specialized, and uh, yeah, very specialized. You cannot talk about it. Uh, they feel a bit uh, insecure. Mm -hmm. That's why we try to set up something. Um, such environment where they can just talk freely, tell their um, opinions and mm -hmm. ignite their curious to ignite their curiosity and passion. We try to do different kind of psychophers, scientific cafes, and just talk about our research, uh, what we encounter, our uh, difficulties, and um, what our excitements in the field, mm -hmm. and especially with high students because they are really. In this, I've been there, and I know that you can you can be confused what to do uh, right, because right. you. Know what also, it can be a very uh, isolating feeling, right? Like uh, sometimes mathematics and uh, science can be very. Uh, what's the right word here? Like, uh, many times students are scared. 
to, to pursue <laughs> yes. it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It scared maybe uh, thinking, oh my, my, like I had these feelings before, maybe I can fail, something will not go right. But mm. there's someone they can look up for or someone right. who can tell everything is going to be all right. Just follow <laughs> yes. it. take this momentum and go, go with it. Or other way, maybe uh, they realize that they don't want to do it. So if we can be helpful anyhow, I would, I'm very happy to meet with um, different kinds of people to do the science uh, communication and uh, deliver uh, information for, to them yeah. uh, in an understandable manner without right. the old uh, technical jargon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, uh, with, with children, it's very interesting because they ask you different kinds of questions that are mm, yeah, yeah. hard to answer sometimes. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hearing hearing you talk like makes makes me feel like uh, mentorship and cre creating a safe environment is very important to people mm -hmm. of all ages. I think where they can pursue uh, what they desire and freely, like you said, like Kaust gave you the opportunity to pursue freely, right, without exactly. any specific pressure. So, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think yes. that's and we have these Kaust schools, which are uh, mm -hmm. our schools. We they, they look up to us because this is mm. university <laughs> and having communication with them is really great. Right. All right. So, Altinai, what's your view on women in science? Like nowadays, mm -hmm. we see um, big publishers like American Chemical Society, elsewhere, Wiley, etc. So, they, they are trying to create more, um, like a more uh, diversity in science and particularly in, in terms of gender and uh, because historically we know the contribution of women in science has been very low nowadays it's very uh, like rising which is a very good sign and nowadays also i see several journals also have like editor-in-chief uh, uh, famous women scientists so what is your take on it and how important is it for like a uh, younger generation to have um a role model women scientists to look up to, to develop science and uh, help everyone prosper? Uh, as you said, we need the role models in mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, female role models because right, right. in the past, a woman didn't have opportunities. There was no one, there was no opportunities for them. That's why there were no much uh, female. Yeah, many, many reasons. Yeah. For many reasons, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, young girls would didn't have anyone to look mm. up to or say, okay, if she was successful, I can also be right. and, mm -hmm. uh, and relate to it somehow. Mm -hmm. If we have more and more uh, females in the field, mm -hmm. there will be more and more young generation who would be saying, okay, it's possible. Sure. I will also go for sure. it. And uh, that's why it's, I think this is the most um, important aspect for females to strive mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to follow their passion and dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, freely, um, yeah. and 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 uh, another point is, as you said, diversity. Diversity is the key for any, not only success for um, how, bringing different kind of uh, ideas, yeah, from different perspectives. Mm. So I think males in general they they give the different um, point of view, different kind of uh, strength, different sure. uh, uh, perspective to the problem. So. The diversity would and fulfill the this diversity uh, criteria, but it's not only female and male. It's also for different kind of people from different backgrounds, sure, different cultures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that is the key success of US because mm. in US mm. that different kind of um, diverse people from with different backgrounds who come there and pursue. This is their strength, and uh, of course it has to be multicultural, multi. Uh, Different kind of uh, people, right, basically. Right. Yeah, <laughs> bring this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nowadays and, I think um, in almost all aspects of life and uh, almost all sectors, uh, the inclusion of diversity is happening, and um, that's uh, very nice to see. Yeah. Even in the movie, have you seen the uh, new Marvel? What's the name? Eternals. Etern Eternals. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't watched it yet. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but but I know about it. Yeah. yeah, the main role is a uh, Asian woman. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, Gemma Chan, <laughs> right? Gemma Chan. I'm not sure what's her name, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. and yes, I'm very glad to see that 
these kind of changes are happening and there are more and more females in the high positions, uh, role positions. Right. Representation is important because identity is a very important aspect of our life. So if people can relate to certain, like, if you keep on presenting the same same thing over and over again until unless you introduce diversity then you will not hear the voices all around like um, there are various peoples various ethnicities cultural background stories so yeah i, I think this started moving uh, so we are <laughs> yes. still at the beginning of this journey yeah, you know, yeah. but it's the stone has started moving so um, mm -hmm. it's really exciting to experience it, we will be seeing the whole the development, how the woman mm -hmm. will be reach their full potential. Yes. Our <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, Altenai, um, uh, by the way, congratulations on your new position at the uh, Caspian Seal um, Research and Rehabilitation Center in Kazakhstan. So, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about that briefly. Like, um, uh, I read up on the um, internet about the Caspian Seal and it's uh, the issues it's facing, like its population has declined more than 90% in the last hundred years, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's uh, terrible. And um, so what are the reasons behind it? And how is the Caspian Sea Seal Research and Rehabilitation Center working to fix the issue? And mm -hmm. what's your role going to be there? And mm -hmm. also how people like me or others can support of course, uh, I checked the website and there are options for donations and support. So can you talk about that briefly? Yes, so thanks to my experience as a researcher, I work with um, marine animals. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, when I started the research, I thought I'm interested, but people wouldn't be interested in the future. It will be just for me, my little project. But no, uh, I was contacted by um, Kazakh organization, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan Seal Research Rehabilitation Center. They're interested in uh, studying uh, Caspian seal, which is endemic mm. to the Caspian um, environment. Region, yeah. Region, and uh, as you say, they, unfortunately, the, it's a critical situation for them. 90% mm. of their population is uh, dying, and they're trying um, to find the places where they um, ground, where they uh, give their offsprings and protect those areas because oh. uh, those areas are being uh, damaged by many reasons. For mm. example, so we have the oil drilling. Kazakhstan has oil yeah. and near the Caspian Sea and uh, a lot of oil spills and drilling and pipelines mm. uh, are affecting to the natural habitat. Mm. They're also building different kinds of islands, uh, artificial islands, which affects their Ecosystem. places where, yeah, where they stay in the northern eastern of Kashmir. That's where the Kazakhstan is, and I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, that is uh, forty percent of all the Caspian seals are living there. Um, and right now, it's a really critical moment. If uh, we uh -huh. don't do anything, they can extinct forever. And you, it's heartbreaking. This, uh, it's heartbreaking, and they are so cute. Have you seen them? Yeah. <laughs> they're really, really cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's heartbreaking and this organization uh, it's a unique organization they not only do research they try to study the caspian sea environment the behavior of caspian caspian seal and to rehabilitate them so they made the whole center that uh, brings those seals and cure them if they're sick they will they will nurture them if they have some problems they will cure it with special specialists and put them back to the natural environment Mm -hmm. Of course, we're talking about uh, only dozens of them, not thousands of them. Right. But at least there is some efforts to uh, that can help to their survival. Mm -hmm. uh, I was selected in the scientific council. There are only mm -hmm. nine people there, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy about it. I hope we can develop something that is uh, really useful for their uh, survival. Uh, I right. mean, in terms of technology. Uh, I will be responsible more into the innovation technological part. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of marine scientists who will be developing certain, uh, hopefully, uh, procedures to how we proceed with the research on the, oh. with all the marine animals. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, donations uh, is welcome. Anything is welcome. <laughs> Any help. Uh, maybe you know how to, mm -hmm. the ways how to cure them or how to, there are not much specialists who can actually. Sure, yeah. Or um, 
some techniques uh, how we can uh, uh, yeah i suppose the the main thing is to make people aware of the issues so okay. that the word goes around and eventually people who can directly support the cause can come up and contact the organization it's always there so mm. yes in yeah. in the, in the aim is uh, to how to say um, to do independent research mm, like okay, okay. Uh, so it's they, specifically they, funded exactly so they they just do research as um right right yes and it's really exciting uh, <laughs> uh the i might be there the chief uh chief scientist mm, wow <laughs> yeah, congratulations <laughs> again yeah <laughs> after graduation of a yeah. phd mm -hmm. because uh i have to go back to kazakhstan uh, to work there because government paid for me Oh. Mm, okay okay i worked for two years in kazakhstan i still have three years mm -hmm. so i'm looking forward to make some real contribution yeah that will be great yeah mm -hmm. yes so okay really okay so um Alt and I, we are like closing up on the one hour mark and um so um thank you very much for sharing all your experience and i wanted to ask like um, do you have any specific comments for new students or researchers coming up into the grad school or um, going into research do you have any word of advice for them before we close the session my advice is uh, i think to use the momentum of the excitement uh -huh. and <laughs> yes yeah and just mm -hmm. just go with the flow <laughs> don't overthink Mm -hmm. don't uh, be scared yeah work hard stay focused stay tuned mm -hmm. and everything will be fine stay positive stay good, word, positive. good words of advice yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh do you have any questions for me or otherwise we'll then end the session uh thank you so much for having this talk with you it was yeah. really exciting uh -huh. i'm just interested so you're doing a pollution uh, uh research yeah are you planning to stay in academia as we talked or you want to do some impact for example in india the air pollution for example new delhi is, is really <laughs> in another very good condition right now would you like to do it's, something it's almost on the um bottom end right in the world <clears throat> like beijing used to be but nowadays like india is like uh, going over that so it's a uh, very terrible and um, yeah i know people personally who have been affected by the situation and i've been to new delhi particularly in the winter season uh, you know like the air quality index is too so bad like uh, i had some irritation in my eyes and skin so it was terrible and i have first hand experienced the situation and it, i think it's more of a you know a policy issue as compared mm. to technological issue uh, the implementation um, in my opinion the implementation of the policy on the industrial sector and the sources of pollution there are not in place to check all the issues so it's more mm. of uh, like a policy related issue but sure um, the government is uh, contacting the uh, local experts in the institutes and universities to try to come up with a feasible solution um, mm but i haven't studied that area um, really well like what is the crux of the issue so i cannot comment further like what exactly is going on <clears throat> as far as my staying in academia is concerned like i i love being in academia so <laughs> most likely uh, yeah i've seen two top two percent <laughs> two thousand citations so, it's very impressive for PhD students. right so like i'm just about to graduate and um, then i will like um, remain in academia and mm -hmm. um sure like of course i can, uh, never say never right so if um, any opportunity comes like from the industrial sector or some uh, public sector so i'll be open to that collaborating and other stuff but right now i do not have any immediate plans to like go away from academia because uh, this is my home so mm. Yes. Would you like to stay in Korea or go well, uh, for for now? I'm planning to stay in Korea because um, I, I love I love it here, and I think I'll have some opportunities here. Uh, but uh, eventually, I do not have. I haven't planned like for the long term, so I don't know where I will end up. Like mm -hmm. I'm op I'm open to working anywhere, so I don't Maybe know. Because of minus forty. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs>
<laughs> Here, uh, in, in the super winter in Korea, it touches uh, minus uh, 20. The record temperature is minus 23. So I reckon that's nothing for you, but for, for me, it's like super cold. <laughs> Is, yeah, it's, just, it's considered warm winter. It's warm. It's not cold. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really nice. yeah. And uh, how did you, what, what um, motivated you to make this channel, especially for uh, Korean, uh, Indian Korean society? Mm -hmm. Really uh, nice and Yeah, so um, I, I'm actually not one of the founders, but uh, um, so the founders initially, I think it, it, it began before the pandemic situation and mm. uh, the group was formed just before that. But during the pandemic situation, the traveling was a very big issue initially, like mm. uh, people coming from India, like there were lots of restrictions. And even right now, uh, the direct flights are not working from between mm -hmm. India and Korea, primarily because of the diplomatic situation. I don't know completely. So there are like other routes and uh, there were <laughs> like the... Um, like the regulations were changing every day, right? So mm. at that time, the group was uh, like expanded a lot because it was offering support to people from this end, from the Korean end, from the Indian end, and also because uh, we had like communication with the embassies. So um, in that manner, the group expanded. Uh, eventually we planned, like we should be having some conversations with people, uh, particularly in um, from the academic setting, from the science background, because, you know, the majority of Indian diaspora in Korea is um, in science and tech and engineering. So initially we plan to talk with those people, but generally I th then I began expanding talking with uh, various other people as well. Like I talked with uh, social scientists and um, other people. So, yeah, so that's how it's going. And um, the objective is to like, put the conversation out there so whoever mm -hmm. watches it um, because I think it's important to let the world know about the uh, perspective and the experiences people have so yeah. that's really interesting I've yeah. seen some interviews uh, where very uh, yeah. like that and stuff. <laughs> um, um, how do you think you can increase the visibility mm -hmm. of your uh, channel yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that because uh, we are in the early stages, I, I think, like, um, yeah, we have to research more about that, like how to increase the reach and everything, because uh, we do not have anyone who has have had the experience of uh, like growing uh, social channels and stuff like that. So uh, I'm primarily um, on the talking end. So I, I just uh, talk with people because that, that's what I enjoy. And mm -hmm. um, the other group uh, from the community, so other people might be looking into that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Because it, it's very, it's a narrow content. Uh, it's right, right, right. It, it will not be super <laughs> visible to the whole sure, world. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, I think it has a great potential to reach a high mm -hmm. level of visibility. <laughs> anyway, so of if, if we put it out there and it's a uh, public, um, Hopefully, if people will find it, but um, of course, we need to increase the visibility and all that. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you much. Mm. So, anyway, uh, LT9, thank you very much for the conversation. And uh, yeah, hopefully, we stay in touch. And uh, yeah, best wishes for your journey ahead. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to meet uh -huh. you here virtually. Hopefully, <laughs> we can meet South Korea. By the way, we will go in summer, most probably. Where? If the I think it's Seoul, um, the conference, but um, it might be virtual. I'm not sure if they allow us to come. It will be in summer. Nowadays, uh, South Korea is opening. So I think you will have the opportunity to come. So if you come, just let me know. We'll hang out and I'll show you some places. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. So um, take care and see you around. Yes. See mm. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.